I think we're going to get rolling. Uh, again, my name is Mike Livingston, and I want to welcome everybody to our online discussion this evening. I'm uh, the South Central Washington Regional Director for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. We value these opportunities to hear directly from the people that we serve um, and talk to, talk to you about fish and wildlife uh, and conservation and management in our state. Um, we uh, still have some people joining. I'm just gonna go through a couple little things here. And I wanna also announce that we're joined tonight by our director of Department of Fish and Wildlife, Kelly Suswin. So uh, Kelly, welcome aboard and um, good to see you tonight. Thanks, Mike. Uh, good to be here. Excited to be here as we continue to do just what you said, get out of here and get keep in contact with the people, the public that we serve. We've, we started these a few years ago, really uh, in person at that time. But with that, uh, the events of the last couple of years, we've switched to a virtual format and we look forward and we will get back out there in person when we can. These, these really are, these are intended to be for you, the public, to have the opportunity to engage with, with uh, folks here at DFW. Particularly excited tonight, we have the regional management team. So these are the leaders of our wildlife, fish, uh, habitat, what, and lands programs. These are the folks that are making the decisions in the regions. They're running these programs in the regions here where you're located. Uh, these are the people you really want to know at DFW. These are the, the movers and shakers in your region. So uh, we thought it was time to get them on, on the camera here with us and uh, have an opportunity for you to interact with them. So uh, we are reserving most of the night for question and answers, or at least a good chunk of it, because uh, that way we can make sure we hone in on what you're interested in instead of just uh, talking to you. And we want to talk with you. So with that, Mike, if you want to get us rolling. Yeah, thank you, uh, Director Suswin. <clears throat> it is good to be here tonight. Again, I'm Mike Livingston, Regional Director for our South Central Region. We're going to start tonight with a few updates, um, what's going on with the department statewide, and also some region-specific topics. I want to let you know that tonight's event is being recorded. Um, it will be posted online afterwards for those who are unable to attend. So if you have people who maybe wanted to see it but couldn't, um, you can point them to our website. They'll be able to find the, the link and view it later. Um, we're going to commit most of tonight, tonight to question and answer, but we are going to have some short presentations. Before that, we want to introduce the regional management team, folks that have joined us tonight. And I'm going to um, first hand this off to Scott McCorkendale with uh, Wildlife. Hi. Uh my name is Scott McCorkady. I'm the Regional Wildlife Program Manager. I uh, work out of the regional office in Yakima. Worked for the agency for about uh, 20 years, and I supervise the wildlife management and lands operations in the region. And Perry, why don't you go ahead? Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Perry Harvester, the Regional Habitat Program Manager for Region 3, South Central Washington. Uh, I manage the uh, <clears throat> habitat program staff within the region. We do a lot of environmental review. Uh, we also administer the hydraulic code program in Washington state to protect uh, fish life within our waters of the state. Thank you. Over to you, Bob, Captain Weaver. Good evening. I'm Bob Weaver. I'm the law enforcement program manager uh, for Region 3. Uh, the Region 3 law enforcement program is responsible for patrolling five eastern Washington uh, counties. And we are allotted 14 commission staff to uh, patrol with. Over to you, Darren. Yeah, good evening, everybody. I'm Darren Fidel. I'm the Commissioner of Fish Program Manager, overseeing the fisheries management and capacity fish production. And we have an outstanding team in the region. We have two district fish biologists, one who covers the Ashmont to the Cap counties, and the other who covers Benton and Franklin County. And several seasonal staff who just wrapped up fisheries monitoring in the year and after as well as a whole host of dedicated action employees that fulfill action And in addition, we work closely with this program staff within the science division of the state. So glad to be here tonight. I'll pass it on to Ross. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Ross Huffman. I'm in the uh, Wildlife Program Lands Division here in Region 3, uh, based out of Yakima. Um, I oversee our wildlife areas and water access sites and uh, um, been with the department about 12 years and uh, turn it back over to Mike. 
Thank you all. I um, really appreciate you introducing yourselves. We're also got some um, uh, species specialists and um, experts, technical panel, including Paul Hofarth and Alf Hawkins. They are um, some of our um, fish managers and um, science people, as well as Brian Lyon, who supervises our hatchery complex in the region. So um, as we get into the Q&A, these are the folks who know the real um, goods of what's going on in the region, and we'll be relying on them. Um, <clears throat> so our, I just wanted to really quickly point out that region, our, our state's re divided into three, six regions. This is region three. And yeah, we're getting our presentation going here. Um, the South Central region includes Benton, Franklin, Kittitas, and Yakima counties. Um, our, we have headquarters in Yakima, um, which is where I'm based, as well as our management team. And we have field offices in Pasco and Ellensburg. We also have three hatcheries in the region uh, and uh, several wildlife areas with um, various levels of um, offices and buildings there. Um, we always um, encourage you to reach out if you have questions to call our customer service. Uh, you can find the phone number online or send an email to Team Yakima um, and um, our folks will be happy to answer those questions and send them to uh, those who are um, able to answer your question. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand it over to Director Suswin to give us a few updates statewide and, and also um, some regional information. So Kelly, take it away. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so usually when I come out, folks are interested in what's going on at headquarters. For us this time of year, we're about to go into the legislative session. Starts uh, January 10th. It's a short session this year, supplemental session. So it's a 60 day sprint, a uh, very short session, usually with high priority items, not the, the, the bigger, bigger efforts take a little more time. So we're going in this year pretty, pretty lean. We have four bills that we're going to be pushing at the legislature that we're sponsoring. The first is uh, to make hunting and fishing more accessible. This is really an accumulation of a bunch of little things that we think will help our, our participants. Things like aligning the youth age for hunting and fishing at 16, allowing a temporary fishing license to be used on the uh, Lowland Lake opener. That's our biggest event of the year. Currently, you have to buy a full fishing license. We want to have folks to have the opportunity to get out there and, and enjoy that. Uh, we think that it's a good opportunity to get them hooked on fishing and to come on back. We'll also be providing a $20 discount to people who are finishing their hunter safety education. So it gives them a little uh, easier access into the into the uh, sport. And we'll also be, and there is a uh, an alignment for some military and college students as well that are full time college students or military former military, give them a little better access to our resident rate so that uh, we can give them a little easier entry into to the hunting and fishing as well. So it's a pretty small impact us financially. It's really just an accumulation of good things we want to uh, provide for, for our, our participants. We have a, a bill on our uh, American with Disabilities Act Advisory Committee. Uh, so much of our stuff is really specified in legislature. We've got some pretty tight controls there. This is one of our committees and we have a legislation that uh, specifies specifically what kind of uh, disabilities would allow you to be on that committee. We're trying to align it more with the federal ADA that if you have any disability, you're eligible to be a member of that committee, uh, be selected as a member of that committee. We're also expanding it so that folks who are working with disabled in, in the outdoor sports have the ability to sit on that committee. There's a lot of great uh, minds and thinking and, in, and knowledge in that group of folks. So we want to have uh, some of those on the committee as well. So again, a bit of a housekeeping to make that a more effective committee. Uh, increasing access to state recreational lands. This is a, a work with parks in particular. So this is really around the Discover Pass. And Parks has the ability to do 12 free days at parks around the state under the Discover Pass. Unfortunately, the legislation is it's just for parks. And so if you come to a DFW facility on those free days, you still need to have that, that placard and ha have your Discover Pass. So this would align it to make it clear that when it's a free day on Discover, it's a free day on our lands as well. And we're hoping that also gives us an opportunity to influence a little bit uh, with the Department of uh, Parks to pick days that are really suitable for for the folks that are out there hunting and fishing and, and, and enjoying our lands as well. The last one's pretty simple. Again, this is a, a remnant of 
having so much of our stuff in legislation, but it allows us some uh, room to do electronic print from home uh, and electronic licenses. We hear loud and clear from uh, our hunters and anglers that they want this. We are building the technology to do it. We need to have the legal footprint that allows us to do it. So uh, that that's what that one is all about. We're pretty excited about that. It not only makes it easier for us and easier for the hunters and fisher, but it gives us access potentially to, to more real-time data to help us manage the resources. So that's it for us going in on the legislative front. I'll hit on a couple of budget items here on the next slide. I, I won't through all the hit all these. If you want to go to our website, we have a, a more detailed description of everything that I'm talking about here tonight. Uh, these are the budget elements. We're looking at a pretty good budget. The state fiscal forecast recently was up. Uh, so we think on at least on the administrative side, we're looking pretty good on the uh, capitals are going to be a little more tight this year. But uh, so we're doing freshwater monitoring. A lot of that's this. This is uh, throughout the program. A lot of that's on the west side. This is really our ability to get out there to creel to make sure that we're staying within our impacts when we do fishing. It also has a little bit of environmental monitoring to help us manage the fisheries. Uh, the next one is the improved monitoring for, it says mountain goats. This is really much broader. It's deer, elk, mountain goats, uh, bighorn sheep, and even some turkey in there. So this is really getting us replacing some old equipment. We do a lot of uh, collaring on these animals for, for our information. Collars wear out. We have to replace collars. We have to recapture animals. So this allows us to, to get back up uh, where we would like to be on all those activities. Been a lot of support for it so far. Uh, the salmon recovery, that's getting salmon planning, salmon recovery planning in the Growth Management Act. So that's that when you get your local permits, we want those local governments thinking about how they can be conditioning permits to promote salmon recovery. Right now it's not clearly spelled out and DFW is the technical support for those local groups and this funds us to get out there and actually help local communities uh, build that salmon recovery into their growth management act. Salmon team capacity, this is uh, more and more every year, it's more technically comp complex to manage our salmon fisheries. So this builds basically our team has a lot of uh, additions for the technical capacity for some of the, the high tech modeling we're doing. Uh, also helps us when we work with our co-managers. We, uh, we work with 20 some tribes around the state some of those tribes actually have a team as big as our team individually. And so when you add it all up, we're, we're, we're catching up there. So this would be an opportunity to do just that. The forage fish is primarily a West side thing, but basically that's something that got moved to another agency's budget and they weren't supporting it. So we're asking the legislature to move it back to us so that we can do it. We use the Washington uh, Youth Corps to actually do that work. So it's a great opportunity for them to get exposed to the, the industry as well. Hatchery production and compliance, this is to make sure we can stay current on our marking requirements. So that adipose fin removal, it also allows us, uh, just like everybody else, our cost of business are going up. We have to have uh, discharge permits for our hatcheries. We have to have uh, environmental permits for our construction at hatcheries. This would cover that. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry for the blast, but I don't wanna take up too much time because I really want you talking to your local experts here. Uh, safe and sanitary water access areas, it's a little broader than that. We have 33 wildlife areas and over 500 water access points across the state. In the last year under COVID, we saw a huge increase and in influx of people using them, which is great. That's exactly what we want to see. But with that increase in people, we also saw an increase in littering, vandalism, et cetera. We want to make sure that we can get out there and make sure those, those, those facilities are safe and friendly for our users. And the last is to support some fish passage rulemaking. It's really around fish screening. Again, this, this is that base level of effort we need to be doing if we're gonna recover our salmon in particular, salmon and steelhead. So that's, uh, I, I apologize for the whirlwind uh, on that, but I uh, wanted to touch on most of those or all those. And uh, again, there's more information on our website. The other issue that I think I will touch on here uh, it's a statewide issue, so it's run out of headquarters, but it affects everybody across the state. And I know there's a lot of interest in it. I'm certainly getting a ton of email. And that's around the, the recent spring bear decision by our Fish and Wildlife Commission. So that was November 19th. The agency recommended to our commission to proceed with the 2022 spring bear season. It's something we've been doing for a long time. 
Uh, a lot of question, a lot of controversy around that hunt. It's been growing over the last few years. Uh, commission got a lot of negative feedback on, on that hunt. And so uh, we currently, the rules allow for the hunt that just occurred this past year, 2021. It's silent to 2022. I'll go into a little detail because I, I get asked this question all the time. Uh, that means we have to propose a hunt and we have to have an affirm, affirmative approval of that hunt to move forward. We proposed the hunt and it was a 4-4 tie. And so that means we do not have affirmative approval to move forward with a new hunt. The existing hunt is already over. So that basically means there's nothing on the books for 2022. That tie vote was uh, means we will not be having a spring bear season in 2022. I think it's important to note the commissioners were asking for additional information, population status. Uh, we're working already with the commission to make sure we can answer any unanswered questions that we, they may have. Uh, the vote was an up or down vote, yes or no, and the vote went no because of the tie. But all the dialogue around that was a pause for commissioners to get better vetted in what's going on, understand the data for us to provide more science to them. I'm confident it's a pause. We're gonna be working our butts off on the agency side to keep it as a pause. Uh, very unfortunate for 2022, but we are, we're gonna put a lot of energy into trying to get that, that hunt back in 2023. Of course, that requires commission approval, uh, but I, I think we have solid answers to the questions. We think it's a good opportunity. We think the population can sustain it. So we'll be, we'll be uh, continuing to work towards a, a season next year. I think that's about all I wanted to cover on spring bear. We'll, we'll see if what happens in questions. I think with that, Mike, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over because it's, you, it's bad enough talking heads, but talking heads from headquarters when we got all these local experts here is, is not the best use of our time. Well, thank you, Kelly. And it's always good too to um, just let people know what we're up to in the legislative front, which is coming up and um, as a state agency, we do have a, a process that's pretty rigorous that we have to follow for that budgeting. So, um, and then thanks for covering that spring bear. I see that we've already got some questions coming in. A couple of them are related to bear. Um, keep, keep posting your questions. We're gonna get to those here pretty quickly. I am going to spend a, a few moments here talking about one of the, um, <clears throat> I think, really important resources that um, uh, the region three is responsible for managing that has far beyond um, benefits to many people. Um, the region, as I mentioned, is uh, includes Benton, Yakima, Franklin, and Kittitas counties. It starts up at the um, Snoqualmie Pass, White Pass, up at the Cascade Crest. It goes eastward to the Hanford Reach and in the Hanford site. So you're going from uh, precipitation zones of 100 inches or more down to the driest part in the state, which is the Hanford Reach um, area where there's between six and seven inches of rain a year. Um, and as we know, water is life and the Columbia River flowing through this dry, arid um, environment is just crucial for um, many species, both terrestrial as well as, as our, their aquatic species. And the one, the one um, resource here I want to focus in on is the Hanford Reach Up River Bright Falls Chinook. There's a lot of places and a lot of things that I'm really proud of in the region, um, but I just, I, we, we agreed that this would be a good one to feature tonight, and so <clears throat> I'm going to dive into it a little bit, and I'm going to switch gears here. So, uh, <clears throat> So why, am I, why, why is Hanford Reach um, so important? You know, the upriver bright fall Chinook salmon um, begin their life cycle either at one of two hatcheries or in the river, which is the last free flowing stretch of the Columbia River. It's about a 50 mile stretch of um, Columbia River. Um, we have the legacy of the Manhattan Project at the cent central Hanford site. It's the largest uh, Superfund site in, this, in the US. It's um, a lot of money spent um, cleaning up, a lot of complexity related to that. But due to this legacy, um, we have this large conserved block of shrubs depth, which includes really unique habitat, inland dunes. And of course, we have the last free flowing stretch of the Columbia River that has made this place so important for salmon and so many other native species. 
So uh, why is the Hanford Reach Fall Chinook so important? Well, this is the largest population of Fall Chinook in the Northwest. It's a major contributor to the local, regional, and international fishing economies. Beyond economics, it's, it's interwoven into our culture in the Northwest. Um, I'm not sure that all of us can appreciate how important this, uh, this area is. And it's actually, um, for his number of fish that are produced, it's a pretty small, really, uh, chunk of, of um, Washington state. Um, really specifically, this uh, fishery supports commercial, tribal, and sport fisheries from Alaska all the way to the Hanford Reach. It's a real complex um, management scheme that takes to getting um, uh, to manage all these fish uh, along that um, extensive area. And um, our Priest Rapids and Ringgold hatcheries um, release over 11 million juveniles each year contributing to the production. And then in the river each year, there's between 10 and 20 million uh, juveniles that are naturally produced. So this is just a, um, uh, it's a factory of, of fish um, that um, provide really important ecosystem services and also important economic services. Next slide, please. The Priest Rapids hatchery is located just below Priest Rapids Dam. It is owned by Grant County PUD and is operated by uh, WDFW under an agreement. And then downriver, um, the Ringgold Springs hatchery is uh, located on the Franklin County side. And, uh, nat and then in between these two hatcheries, uh, natural spawning occurs along the river. So between those two stars on the map there um, is where the, the natural spawning occurs. Next slide, please. So I don't wanna, this isn't a heavy, uh, <clears throat> detail-y, data-driven presentation, but I did wanna spend a moment on just this one chart. Um, it shows the adult Chinook returns from 2001 to this um, fall, 2021. And uh, the return returns since 2001 um, have varied anywhere between 30,000 um, in 2007, which was a low to a peak of 370,000 in 2015. Um, many of you may, who um, are anglers, may remember that um, huge influx of fish we had in that uh, 2015, 2014 years. In the last couple of years, um, we've had some good returns of around 140,000, providing some excellent opportunity for fishing in September and October in the reach. Not to mention, the fisheries that occur <clears throat> um, on the Washington coast outside of Westport and Elwako, the uh, really popular buoy 10 fishery uh, below Bonneville Dam, then all of the tributaries from the white salmon, the chutes, and the um, Klickitat River. So there's so many different places that people intercept and get an opportunity to fish for these uh, fish that are produced in the reach. So I wanted to highlight some of the importance and the uniqueness of the salmon population. Now I'm just going to touch on what it takes to produce these fish. And I'm just, just scratching the surface of it because um, we don't want to spend a lot of time on talking. But I do want you to um, just get an appreciation um, for that amount of work. So <clears throat> there's an incredible amount of work that goes on into processing these adults when they return to the hatcheries each year. Um, at our Priest Rapids Hatchery, we have about 10 staff that um, work really hard, particularly in November when the fish return. It's a really um, gangbusters kind of outfit going on. I've, I've been there in November a few years ago when they had a whole bunch of fish show up. And it's impressive how many people are working their tails off getting these fish processed, spawned, and all the work that goes into that. That's at the Priest Rapids Hatchery. Next slide, please. And then downriver at our Ringgold Hatchery, there's six employees that work there. Um, when the fish return in the fall, it's an all hands on deck effort to spawn these fish and to collect the critical information. And so this is another component. So we have uh, about eight staff, uh, two permanent and six temporary employees that come on board in our fish science division that do the monitoring and evaluation work while the hatchery crews are spawning the fish. So there's a lot of data that needs to be collected. And it's what these folks do at the hatchery. Next slide, please. 
Along the river, there's also a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, <clears throat> we have crews each year that bra brave the wet and cold and often foggy conditions um, that they experience late in October and into fall uh, or into November. Um, and they're collecting the, uh, the data from the coated wire tags of the spawn fish that are along the um, banks of the river. And if anybody's ever spent any time late in the fall wandering around the Columbia River, I recommend that you don't bring your dog. I learned this lesson years ago where my dog and I were out hiking along the river and she found some of these uh, <clears throat> spawned out fish. And what, what, is, what do dogs like to do? They like to roll in that stuff. So that was a a lesson that I learned that I'll never repeat again. Um, but we also have uh, uh, several people who are doing um, work with the coded uh, tags. We have 10 seasonal employees who are um, working on this monitoring and, and creeling. And I just wanted to point out that prior to the release of the fish um, at the hatchery, these coded wire tags are inserted and they're really tiny. You see that um, small little black um, spec on that fingertip. That is a coated wire tag. Each one of these has a unique number that um, um, enables us to uh, identify that individual. Um, it, it, you can determine where they originated from and also where they, you're going to where you find them. Our staff use a, in this case, a yellow wand that detects the tag and identifies the individuals. All of our hatchery programs um, have specific goals and our monitoring and evaluation team gathers the information to determine if these goals are being met. And that's what all this, um, some of the science work that has to happen at the same time that we're producing the fish in the hatcheries as well as monitoring the natural spawning. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so in, in addition to the incredibly hardworking staff we have, we also have some incredible volunteers. This year was the 10th annual Hanford Reach Fall Chinook Angler Broodstock Collection Project. We work with our partners from the Tri-Cities Chapter of the Coastal Conservation Association and Grant County Public Utility District to organize and use volunteers and their private boats to catch broodstock for our hatchery program. This annual event is called the King of the Reach Fishing Derby. <clears throat> the effort helps us to maintain robust hatchery and wild population genetics. And the number of boats and anglers has grown over the years to the point where we have to actually limit the number of volunteers that we can accept into the, into the effort. Um, this year on October 29, 30, and 31, we had a total of 295 anglers and 76 boats that captured and delivered to the hatchery 603 adult salmon. This partnership and event is a great example of how working with the public enables us to get more work done than we could ever do alone. And I just wanted to um, personally thank all the volunteers that have done that work for us. Um, next and final slide, please. So I just wanted to just wrap up and say, this is a really unique, important resource that's managed out of the region. We have um, some really hardworking folks at both the hatcheries and on the river. Um, we have some fantastic volunteers. And the benefits are felt from Alaska all the way up to the Hanford Reach. And um, I'm hoping that you know some people have some questions related to this and also have um, learned a bit about the Hanford Reach Fall Chinook. And with that, we're going to transition now into our uh, Q&A. So <clears throat> anytime you want, you can type in your question in the comment and Q&A feature on screen. I've seen several people have done that already. Um, let's just please keep your question brief and respectful and submit it at one at a time. Um, when you're doing the uh, verbal um, comments, we do have a moderator that'll be able to keep track of if you raise your hand for that. Um, and if you're participating by phone, you can raise your hand by dialing star nine to unmute yourself. When it's your turn, dial star six. We will answer as many questions as we can tonight. If we run out of time and we don't get to your question, please email them to us at director at dfw.wa.gov so we can follow up with you. Okay, I think we're ready to uh, answer questions. And I, I see there's only two left in the, uh, <clears throat> the Q&A piece here. Do we... 
did people pull those out? I'm not sure what to do there. Um, I think if you go through the chat, Mike. Yeah, okay, I'm looking for, oh, I see. They're in the chat now, gotcha. Thank you, Kelly. All right, so I'm just gonna get these processed here. Bear with me for a second. Okay, so this first question, uh, with fires being managed by the way they have, is the department pushing for more prescribed burns, controlling the fire fuels on state lands to better help wildlife? I am going to send this one over to Ross Huffman, our lands operations manager. Uh, yeah, the short answer is yes. Um, we've got prescribed burn team, um, one stationed up north and one here in Yakima County, and um, we're planning prescribed burns on our lands and have implemented some over the last few years and continue to have more planned and just hope to continue to uh, grow that program and uh, in coordination with DNR and the Forest Service as well. Thank you, Ross. <clears throat> we, we have in, the, in recent years quadrupled the number of foresters we have with the agency. We used to have just one and now we have four. So we're, we're getting caught up and we're also doing a lot of coordination with other agencies. This next question is related to elk. I'm gonna hand it over to Scott McCorkendale. Scott, if you can read that and then answer it for us. Yeah, so I think this is the question. There are fewer branch bull tags given out today than at the first year of the spike only pilot program. Does WDFW feel the spike only program was successful? What is the downfall of an over-the-counter tag for five point or better east side elk seasons? So the spike only program was implemented to uh, address kind of a west-wide phenomena that when, uh, when you had a general season open bull hunting and significant pressure, um, you basically begin to shape a bull population that is almost entirely made up of juvenile or, or sort of teenage bulls. Um, you basically lose the older bull component um, and essentially don't really have any trophy bulls for one, but you also don't have any bulls that are sort of physiologically fully mature. Um, and so that was uh, the approach. We, we made the general season animal a spike bull. And then as uh, the, the branch owner bulls uh, survived from that first season and started to accumulate, then we would offer general season or uh, special permit opportunities for the branch antler bulls, just like we do with antlerless elk and sort of match the, the permitting level with the kind of the, the standing crop of what we believe the, there was for branch antler bulls. Um, the recent downturn in, in the bull permit numbers doesn't really have much to do at all um, with the hunting regulation. It really has to do with uh, some things that happened in the Clockham, the Yakima and the Blue Mountains herd all about the same time beginning in the the winter of 2015, 2016, there was a downturn. Um, all three of those populations are still uh, still below objectives, still working on bringing those numbers back. Um, and with reduced recruitment and reduced number of cows because of the population decline, that caught up with us on, in terms of the bull population. And so we had to start uh, rationing back the, per the permits. Uh, the, the spike only regulation was doing exactly what we had hoped it would do um, in all three herds. And so we do really feel like that was successful. Uh, the second part of the question, what would happen if you had a five point uh, or better general season? Well, with the kind of pressure that we have, um, so we could have 20,000 people in region three hunting elk in the fall. Um, that's far more than there are elk on the hoof at any point in time. Um, with that kind of pressure, most bulls are going to die in the first year they're legal or the next one. Um, and so we would still have the same problem. We'd have uh, a few more um, small branch antler bulls, but we would still expect to see very, very few bulls getting to the six, seven, eight, nine year old age class where they're really starting to get to uh, ma maturity and, um, you know, maximum antler size and things like that. So um, it, it would look eventually pretty similar to general open bull hunting, but there'd be a few more small branch antler bulls. 
Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> There's a lot, lot to unpack there in those, uh, in these questions. And please feel free if you want to follow up, send an email to us, and I'm certain that Scott would be happy to dive into that deeper. Next question is, what kind of upland bird hunting results are you seeing as far as wild upland birds so far this season? Uh, I'm a bird hunter. I can tell you I've been seeing um, it's a little better than last year. We still haven't um, completely recovered. I, I hunt quail, pheasants, chucker um, from um, a few years ago when we had some heavy snows. Uh, there is There seems to be some bright side in um, the quail populations. Pheasants have been really struggling hard. Um, and then chucker, I, I've heard, I haven't been out much this year on chucker, but I've heard that they're doing decently in the region, um, but not as good as they were a couple of years ago. Drought, this past drought a year was impactful to their population in a negative way. Next question, this one, I well, maybe we'll, we'll let um, director and then maybe Scott go on this. During the spring bear hunt webinars, I heard mention of bear hair snag surveys to get scientifically rigorous, rigorous, <laughs> I can't even say <laughs> the word, rigorous bear density estimates. How are those being funded? Director, you want to tackle that? Sure, I can take a, a shot at it. Scott, feel free to, to correct me. I believe there's a little bit of everything in there. So I think there are some hunting fees that are going for that. There's also, I believe, some Pittman Robertson money going there as well. So that's the federal excise tax on firearms and, and ammo that goes in there. So it's it's a kind of a catch-all to support that effort where we go out and actually uh, snag hair and then do DNA analysis and try to give us a, a better, I'd say a more precise estimate of population. Thank you, Kelly. Anything to add, Scott? Nope, that was a very good answer, Kelly. <laughs> Okay, you are going to get this next one, Scott. Can you speak to the preliminary findings of the collared mule deer in Kittitas County as part of the migration corridor study? Are you keying in on migration corridors where self safe passage infrastructure would alleviate road collisions and or where habitat improvement projects could benefit? And I also think that Perry Harvester might be able to chime in on this as well. Yeah, well, we're, we're still fairly early on in this study. Um, uh, there were some additional deer marked last winter, and there'll be some more this winter. So the a lot of the analysis is is really pretty preliminary, and and some of it not even done yet. Uh, in terms of are we keying in on migration corridors for safe passage infrastructure would alleviate road collisions? Um, we're really learning where the migration corridors are. That's the sort of the point of the project. So we we didn't select and mark animals based on some pre-existing assumption about where the migration corridors were. We're going to let the deer tell us where they are. Um, and if they reveal seeing things that are useful relative to highway passage, then we'll, we'll certainly um, uh, contemplate how we would best use that information. Um, it'll also provide information on sort of uh, key habitat areas where uh, development would be um, more impactful to deer populations locally. Um, so, but the, I guess the, the primary part of the, the answer to this question is it's, we're still pretty early on in this project. Perry, you want to add anything? Yeah. Right. As Scott, Scott indicated, this is kind of the intersection between the wildlife program and the habitat program with regard to uh, management of wildlife. So wildlife program is, is doing the study. And then once the study is completed, we have the information about you know, uh, the migration corridors, where the animals are moving to and from, and a better understanding of those locations and the, the habitat utilization on the landscape, then we can use that information when we do the environmental review of various land use activities like energy projects. We have a lot of solar and wind power going on in Kittitas County. We have a lot of different uh, conversions happening of, of habitat. And so when those projects are proposed and they go through environmental review, then we use this information to ensure that impacts to mule deer and, uh, and other wildlife species are fully mitigated. We make sure we try to uh, protect those uh, uh, corridors or have mitigation. Uh, we go through mitigation sequencing to determine what the best methodology to protect and mitigate that habitat is. 
Uh, in some cases, uh, we do have mortality at road crossings, typically probably not in the area immediately north of Allensburg, but one good example is uh, where we've implemented uh, uh, that type of infrastructure. We recently negotiated a modification of an undersized culvert that was only nine feet in diameter on Highway 97 up near the crest of Blewett Pass. It was on Swat Creek. And we, uh, we were able to get a, a modification of that nine foot culvert into a 100 foot bridge and it's already passing deer and elk and other large mammals. So that's one of our recent great success stories regarding uh, uh, crossing of, of busy highways and reducing the mortality as well as providing safety to travelers on the highway. Thank you, Perry. Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> so the next question is, what is the plan for uh, overhunted wildlife areas such as Sunnyside, Sunnyside? The upland wild bird population is almost non-existent. Ross, you want to tackle that? Um, sure, I can do that. So we're, you know, we do a lot of habitat restoration work on the sunny side and, and land management through for some agricultural leases and fields and we're, you know, working to improve those to leave standing crops. Um, they're doing a lot of noxious weed control and trying to um, provide habitat for both waterfowl and upland birds there. So and, um, that's, those are the main things we're doing right now. Um, to, to try to manage the populations. So I know it's a popular area and a lot of people like, like to hunt there. Um, it's a great waterfowl and, and upland bird, bird site. So a lot of those populations just fluctuate naturally based on thing, things that you said, Mike, with droughty years and or cold springs, wet springs, things like that. Yeah, thank you, Ross. One of the things that we struggle with is that we do have these as release sites for pheasants. And that does attract a lot of hunters. And so that will have impacts on wild populations. We try to find the best locations to do that, that are available to the public, that don't impact those wild populations. And sometimes it's, it's a difficult balance to strike. Uh, let's see, uh, is it possible to work on legislation to provide farmers leaving a percentage of crops in the fields for wildlife? This has seemed to have a positive effect in other states. Uh, let's see, who, who, who would like to tackle that one? Anybody want to, as far as the legislative piece goes, Kelly, you want to talk about that for a second? I was, I was worried you were heading my way. <laughs> uh, yeah, it certainly is possible. I don't know of any such legislation right now. We do have related legislation. It's really not about leaving standing crop in the field, but we've got the CRP programs that reserve uh, areas for wildlife in a, a pretty robust CREP program, which is a conservation reserve enhancement program. It's not about leaving standing crop, it's about actually making habitat a crop, and growing that crop, particularly along riparian areas and paying farmers to, to make, help them one, get it established and two, to uh, keep it that way. And so that they aren't, they aren't at a financial loss for that and we all benefit. Specifics to leaving standing crop, I'm not aware of any, but uh, Boy, if you got ideas, send them to director at dfw.wa.gov and, and we'll take a look at them. Thanks, Kelly. We, we have for a number of years used some of our migratory bird stamp money. So when you buy a duck stamp from the state, <clears throat> that generates funds for us to do work. And we have left uh, paid farmers to leave stubble during the fall so that um, waterfowl have a place to find forage instead of them disking it in at the end of the season right when they, after they harvest uh, it. Um, let's see. Hey, Mike. Yeah, Scott. You might just also share that, um, and we actually have a group of biologists that really are primarily focused on uh, wildlife management and habitat on private lands. They're called private lands biologists. Every region has uh, at least one. We have one, he works out of the NRCS office in Prosser. And their job uh, entails a lot of in interacting with uh, landowners and farmers and trying to achieve um, good outcomes for habitat conservation as good as you can in, a, in an environment that's um, you know, commercially farmed and tilled. Um, so that's, that's not new legislation, but there are some federal programs that we do utilize on a regular basis to try to, uh, to help maintain wildlife habitat and some wildlife populations on private lands. Thank you, Scott. 
So <clears throat> this next question um, is, uh, are we seeing an increase in predators on livestock in conflict? Uh, this, this is back to wildlife program, Scott. Sure, um, so we have two uh, wolf packs um, confirmed in our region. Uh, one is a, kind of a longstanding pack uh, near Clay Ellum uh, called the Tianway pack. And then we had a fairly recent uh, discovery of a pack a couple of years ago uh, that has come to be known as the Nainam pack. Uh, it's a very small pack. And in fact, the, the two individuals that were collared in that pack are are currently not in the original range of the Nainam pack. So one of them is actually on a walkabout into Northeast Washington right now. Um, and the other one is is just, it's still in the region, but it's it's not where um, where those animals used to be. We have not had uh, significant levels of conflict with, with the wolves in the region with livestock. We've had a, you know, a couple of small uh, instances where we've had um, an issue or two, but, but uh, nothing, nothing really prolonged or uh, of large scale. We do regularly deal with uh, things like uh, cougar predation, depredation on, on livestock at, in places. Um, we have a bit of that on a regular basis in Kittitas County. Uh, Bob Weaver's uh, enforcement staff uh, worked on that a lot alongside um, our uh, District 8 conflict specialist who works out of Ellensburg. I wouldn't say that we've seen um, really an, a, a kind of substantial increase in that. It's just sort of always there to some degree. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask, Captain Weaver, you want to um, chime in a bit on what your officers are seeing? Sure, yes. Uh, most of the depredation issues that we are seeing uh, tend to be more towards the, the ranchettes, uh, you know, smaller acreages and pieces. A lot of times it's involving goats or sheep, uh, a lot of your, your smaller animals. And you know, that's, that's the biggest portion we're seeing it. You know, Kittitas County tends to have a little bit more of it, but we do see some more of it in Yakima County. And uh, occasionally we, we get some reports of it uh, down in Tri-Cities, but most, most of the Tri-Cities things that we see is more of a sighting than, than anything. I don't know if a lot of people uh, realize this, but we have a legislative mandate that whenever we get uh, reports dealing with cougars, uh, grizzly bears, or wolves, uh, we have to post that information for everyone. And it's on our uh, internet site. And if you go to the species and habitat section and click on living with wildlife, there's a dangerous wildlife uh, reporting tab. And you can click on that and you can see all the dangerous wildlife reports that we've received, including some information uh, dealing with it. Uh, you know, telling a location or giving a general location where it was at on the map and also when it occurred. So that's an that's a, a avenue for additional information people can get. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Scott. Let's see, uh, the next one, this is a, probably for you, Ross. Could I please get an update on the use of e-bikes on department lands? Yeah, so um, we're currently just starting work on that. Uh, there was uh, Senate Bill 54, 52 uh, that directed us to work with DNR to um, review and, and get a public go through a public process to evaluate e-bike use. So that's kind of just kicking off. I think the plan is uh, there'll be a facilitator hired and a lot of public outreach and gathering information. And I think a report is due in September and it'll probably lead to some recommendation or will lead to some recommendations and we'll have to develop some policies and rules on, on e-bikes. Um, Right now it's uh, managed kind of regionally. So depending on um, the, you know, the, the wildlife areas in each region, um, what their priorities are and how things are open for vehicles and what kind of use um, um, uh, the regulations could vary locally right now. But the plan is to get a, to some better guidance in the next year or two and uh, use a public process to get there. Thank you, Ross. <clears throat> that one's an evolving Evolving, interesting issue as far as um, access to wildlife areas, and it's a it's an important balance between managing wildlife habitat and, and also also offering recreational opportunities. Uh, this next one is uh, how is the antelope population doing in our state, and how about an estimated headcount in the area they are populating, Scott? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll focus on the antelope uh, in our region. So there are there are there's another herd of antelope that's been created uh, up by the Colville Reservation, but the Yakima Nation um, had an interest in trying to reestablish uh, pronghorn on reservation lands. They have a considerable amount of shrub step habitat uh, that they uh, manage, and so there have been two transplants of pronghorns um, from out of state um, into the region here. Both of them were run by the Yakima Nation. We uh, were aware and communicated with them. They uh, briefed us regularly on, on what it was that they were uh, attempting to accomplish. Um, and then about now, about every, every other year, we are uh, collaborating with the Yakima Nation on a pronghorn survey. So it's mostly an aerial survey uh, the Yakimas, uh, they put their staff in an airplane and uh, focus on the reservation lands. And then we put some of our staff into the same airplane, uh, on the off-reservation part. Um, and the antelope have sort of spread out. There's still a fair number of them that have remained on the reservation. But um, as you would expect with kind of a, a newly introduced population, there's been some exploration. Um, we get most of our reports uh, from the Horse Evan Hills. That's kind of the the most uh, populated area by pronghorns off the reservation. But we get reports sort of scattered about all over the place too. I mean, we, we, some down in Klickitat County, some uh, further east. Um, and the last count, uh, this coordinated count was done this spring and it accounted for at least 250 pronghorns. So that's that's a really good outcome for the number of uh, antelope that were put in twice, um, far far fewer than that. Um, so they are reproducing and and the uh, and they're surviving and there seems to be a population that is uh, on its way. Uh, it's growing and someday might produce antelope hunting in the state again. Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> yeah, that's a nice emerging um, resource. Uh, so far, appears to be success story here. So, so the other thing that we're doing tonight is taking questions off of Facebook. This first one, I think, is going to go to uh, Director. When will Governor Inslee fill the Eastern Washington ninth spot on the Fish and Wildlife Commission? Uh, I wish I had a clear answer for that. I don't. Not soon enough from, from my perspective. You're right. We are down one commissioner, and it is an Eastern Washington position uh, created when Dave Graybill vacated his position. I have, uh, I know the governor's solicited input. I know they've done a number of interviews and I believe they're, they're on the cusp of actually appointing that commissioner. Uh, but I have heard that for a while now. So I'm, I'm getting a little anxious, but I, I, think, it'll, I think it'll be fairly quick, but uh, ultimately that, that really resides in the, in, the, in the governor's office and I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. And I, I might kick this one back to you too. Um, what about declassification of wolves? When will we have a wolf hunt? We are currently started the periodic status review. So that's for a listed species where we go through and evaluate, are they still listed? Should they still be listed or not? That work will, I would have to look up the dates that's progressing already. Uh, we'll be taking a look from a couple of ways you can delist the uh, population because you've met the objectives in the wolf management plan. There's also just a, a straight list uh, delisting under the, the statute. And we'll be looking at both directions on that. Uh, that that's the first step. Uh, of, we want to get the wolves fully recovered. And, and I really can't speak to where, to where we go after, after that until, until we get there. We're, we're not there yet. A lot of work going on at core to this review was... Uh, a study by the University of Washington, a modeling study to tell us what, what's inhibiting the or the, the dispersal of the wolves. Uh, when will we have a better picture when we'll meet those objectives in the management plan, which is to have wolves in all regions. Uh, that's being evaluated as part of this process as well. And uh, I think we'll just have to wait, stay tuned and see how that turns out. Thank you, Kelly. <clears throat> um, Next question for Scott. What is the department actively doing to try to end the elk hoof disease pandemic? You're muted, Scott. Scott, you're on mute.
Yeah, I was going to say, I think the wolf one was an easier question than this, Kelly. So um, I would have traded you. Um, so elk hoof disease is a, is a real challenge. It's, it, it is a, an illness or a clinical manifestation that's uh, really predominantly in region five and, and a bit in region six. Um, there have been a few isolated detections elsewhere, including in Oregon and Idaho. Um, uh, the legislature did provide some money a couple of years ago to start a research program at the vet school at WSU uh, to do sort of more of the clinical work on, on the disease and causes and, and such things. Um, how, you know, it, it's like many wildlife diseases, it's very, very, very challenging to figure out what you could do with wild populations in the field to remedy something like this. Um, so we're collaborating with, uh, the, with WSU on their work. Um, we're continuing to uh, monitor elk hoof disease issues on the west side. Um, we do do some culling of animals that are clinically affected and, and are suffering. Um, but there isn't, there isn't a, uh, no one has identified yet a practical um, treatment or um, anything like that. So it's, it's just, it's hard. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Scott. And if we are, so we're approaching the seven o'clock hour. I think that um, by the looks of it, we probably could get through the, these um, remaining questions in about 10 minutes or so. So I'm willing to, if the rest of our panelists are and our support team, we'll just keep moving th forward. This is, these are some excellent questions, by the way. Thanks for everybody for participating. Um, next one, right back to you, Scott. Um, what are the thoughts on removing the true spike restriction in GMUs 328-29 for muzzleloader and rifle hunters? Um, that's that's not something we're proposing right now. Um, the spike only regulation that was adopted originally in the Blue Mountains and then in Yakima and Kalakum, um, it it worked in all three places, but it worked a lot better in the Blues and in Yakima. It produced benefits in Kalakum, but they were um, more sublime, and it's pretty easy to understand that. It, Clockham is a not a particularly large elk population, and it's an elk population that basically has really no wilderness component. So these animals are pretty accessible. Uh, they're it's a pretty vulnerable population to to hunting, and so uh, every evidence that we have is that uh, harvest vulnerability for yearling bulls in the Clockham has uh, continued to be challenging. It's it's better than it was. Um, since we adopted spike regulations. And that's why we, we went to the true spike version, which is you know, the, the regular spike version, uh, you only, an animal to be legal only had to have a, an unbranched spike on one side and, and the clock, I mean, it has to have an unbranched antler on both sides. And what that does is it saves a few of the uh, one by twos and one by threes. Uh, they're not legal under the general season. And so they um, get passed on into recruiting as branch antler bulls. And we've got the data that's, that says it's actually improved uh, with that regulation. So uh, if whoever put this question in, if, if you'd really like to have a further conversation, there's a lot more I could tell you, um, but it probably would be best if you could uh, contact me through the regional office and I'd be happy to share that information with you. Thanks, Scott. Hey, we got a, we got a fish question. Any, any suggested reasons for the drop in fall genetic numbers from the spike of 2015? Darren? Yeah, how's my audio? We're doing good. Okay. Um, well, yeah, well, 2015 was kind of a perfect storm of ideal conditions, both in the river and the ocean. So it was, it was quite a year for returns in a lot of places. And, we really haven't been in those conditions since then. There, there's indications that the ocean conditions um, are starting to turn around, um, and that will certainly help with survival and returns. Um, <laughs> so hopefully things are starting to look up. I don't know if we'll see anything like the returns we saw in 2015 anytime soon, um, but, but hopefully there's an uptick on the way. Thank you, Darren. Paul, did yeah. you want to? 
add anything to that? Uh, nope, I'm right there with Darren. Yep, that's uh, kind of where we're at. We're, like I said, the ocean conditions just came out. Some of the indicators are looking very promising. Keeping my fingers crossed, uh, we'll be having a big public meeting again this spring, uh, going over our salmon uh, returns, or, or at least our forecast. So uh, stay tuned. Also, uh, out migration conditions during those years were very favorable prior to that 2014-15 time period. Um, and more recently, we've had very warm temperatures during out migration, which led to quite high mortalities of our juvenile fish uh, as they went out to sea. So that was a contributing factor as well. Yeah, the drought of 2015 certainly was a problem for the, that created um, some poor returns in the future <clears throat> that we've experienced. Okay, so let's see. Next question is what areas can I duck hunt on the Columbia River? Yeah, I might take that one. Um, so on the Columbia in this region, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service manages several um, <clears throat> refuge units starting over in Benton County, um, down at the Patterson area. Uh, you have the um, Ridge unit and Patterson unit. So the Umatilla Refuge is what it is and it's a good place. And if you move up towards the Tri-Cities, you have the McNary Refuge, um, Two Rivers unit and also Burbank um, on the slough there. And then if you move further up the river, you get onto the Hanford Reach and on the uh, <clears throat> left bank, Franklin County side, there's, um, plenty of opportunity there to hunt uh, up until you get to the wooden power lines, which um, cross the Columbia River. And that's a the stretch up above there is a, um, a sanctuary for, for waterfowl. But there's, there's quite a few places along the Columbia, particularly related to these federal refuges. Um, and I encourage you to go online and look at their website and find those places. They can be phenomenal places to duck on, particularly when things get cold and they move south from up in the Upper Columbia Basin, where they seem to be currently hanging out, like at potholes and in that area. Okay, so let's see this next question. I might, this is going to be Perry. Why can't we use hand pumps, not gas powered pumps, for prospecting? Uh, similar to Scott's question, this would probably be better for someone to, to call me directly and explain exactly the nature of the equipment that they're talking about. And I can, uh, I can better determine and assess whether or not that is something we could permit under an individual HPA or not. Um, we do allow some of that, but at the same time, we, uh, we have to um, comply with the state legislation that was recently passed regarding uh, the use of certain types of equipment. So uh, that would be a question for uh, someone to call me directly here at the office and I can uh, dig into the details exactly uh, what the nature of the equipment is and we may be able to permit under uh, that under an individual HPA. Thank you, Perry. I, and I've just been pointed out that I did skip one and I apologize for that. This is, uh, can there be a toxic algae prevention plan put in place for Friarito ponds up in, uh, in Kittitas County outside of Ellensburg? Who, who might want to take a, take a stab at that? I mean, Ross, so this comes under lands. Um, I don't know, Perry, maybe you have some thoughts on that too. Uh, yeah, I can start. I mean, it, it's, it's been an annual problem for the last few years. Um, and to my knowledge, I definitely can look into it some more. Um, I don't know of any way to prevent it off the top of my head that would fit into something we have and the tools that we currently have for managing these, uh, these ponds and and stuff, but happy to look into it some more. Um, it just has to do with, I think, with oxygen and water circulation and the temperatures and all that kind of stuff. It's a naturally occurring event with these type of waters. Um, but I know there is there, there has been research done and there's things that happen on private lakes to, to try to manage it. So we can look into it some more, but um, happy to, if someone wants to reach out to me at the region office, we can talk about some more. Thanks, yeah. Alex Perry. Yeah, Ross is correct. There's not much we can do about that. Uh, one of the contributing factors in addition to the temperature is the nutrient loading in that area. Um, the water that feeds in there is uh, indirectly part of an irrigation system. We get a lot of indirect nu nutrient loading with uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, which also drives the uh, 
um, the production of the, the algae. So that along with a lot of long sunlight uh, days, a long photo period during late summer with warm temperatures, and then you get the fertilizer or nutrients in there, and then you have the toxic blooms. So there's not a lot we can do uh, about that right now. Thank you, guys. Looks like you're in the hot seat here, Director. Uh, <clears throat> what does WDFW feel, no, does WDFW feel there's a conflict of management goals having non-hunters and fishers as commission members? Does WDFW feel two commissions should be created, one for non-game wildlife with environmentalists, non-hunters as members, and another for fish and game animals as conservationist hunters and fishers as members to avoid conflicts towards management goals? Well, that's a, that's an easy one for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank, thanks, Mike. You want to take a shot? <laughs> uh, actually, I, I, I don't mind this question at all. I, it, might, it might surprise people, but I do not think there's a conflict of management goals of having non-hunters and anglers as commission members. Some of our strongest proponents for hunting and fishing on the commission don't actually hunt and fish themselves. And so it's, I don't think it's a requirement that you do that. I think we have to keep in mind, too, that the wild fish and wildlife of this state belong to all the residents of the state. Uh, and so we need to address that. We're actually putting efforts within the agency to become relevant to those people who don't hunt and fish. Because whether, if you live in Washington, you live a better quality of life because of the fish and wildlife we have. And they belong to you as a resident and you have an obligation as a resident to help manage them. Uh, that means helping financially, that means helping with awareness, that means helping with some of the, the actions we're gonna have to take if we wanna preserve fish and wildlife, given the, enormous growth in population, the climate change we're facing, it's gonna take all of us to do that. Uh, and I don't think having two commissions is a, is a good idea. Um, I got my hands full with one, frankly, uh, but, but more, more less flippantly, that's just another political layer that I think avoids the real problem. Game animals, non-game animals, we're facing a tough time with climate change, with population, we need to take an ecosystems approach. What's good for fish and wildlife is good for fish and wildlife, whether we hunt them or not. Uh, the key thing I think we need with the commission is we have, give me commissioners are open-minded and driven by the science. We have a mandate, preserve, protect, perpetuate all fish and wildlife in the state, not just that to which we can hunt. And the second part of that mandate is we attempt to maximize opportunity for fishing and hunting for those species. So I think that can be done just, just as long as those folks are dedicated to the conservation and preservation and protection and en enhancement of fish and wildlife. And they also support hunting and fishing as an opportunity. I don't think they have to do it themselves. Certainly I want some hunters and fishers on there because uh, you know, most of us at Fish and Wildlife got here somehow because of a passion for fish and wildlife. And uh, for me, that passion is driven originally and still by hunting and fishing. So. I want that perspective on there, but I don't think it has to be exclusive. I think you took a tough question and answered it possibly. Thank you. Uh, this one, this next one, it's a fish question. Will WDFW increase hatchery production? Why or why not? Any concerns of hatchery fish impact on wild fish? This is probably a two-parter, uh, maybe kind of a Big picture, Kelly, and then I'd like to have some of our fish folks chime in on the impact question. Well, well on, the, on the big picture, yeah, we actually have a, a, a directive from our commission to try to find opportunity to increase production. What we have to do is make sure we're doing that in a way that gets to the second part, and I'll let our fish experts talk about that, that we do it in a way that doesn't impact our recovery of wild fish. Uh, but we are always looking for, we're, we've actually put together a, a, a plan it's basically an infrastructure plan that says if we can increase, want to increase production, I'm thinking primarily of salmon, salmon steelhead, where can we do that? Where do we have the capacity? Where do we have the hatchery capacity, the infrastructure? And where do we have the regulatory capacity and the environmental capacity to actually introduce hatchery fish and not mess up our, our wild gene pool that we're trying to recover? So yes, we can. Yes, we are looking for it. And frankly, it's going to be fairly limited where we can because we're, we're kind of up against it in most places. But uh, we got a bunch of folks here on the line that know a lot more than I do about it. Yeah, um, why don't we start with ELF and fish science? <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I, I think I'll just mirror a little bit uh, what Kelly just said. Yeah, as an agency, we do have concerns about hatchery fish you know, and their potential impact on, on wild fish. And locally, certainly, you know, we've talked about the reach a lot tonight. And uh, Mike talked about our monitoring and evaluation. And it, it goes into what the goals of a particular program are. And one of the goal, you know, goals is to not have a, or to have a minimal impact on wild fishes. And in order to do that, what we're doing is going out, trying to evaluate or determine the proportions of wild and hatchery fish out in the spawning grounds, wild and hatchery fish in the hatchery, and trying to achieve some sort of balance with respect to uh, not overwhelming any particular population with, a, you know, with hatchery fish, um, but using hatcheries as a tool to uh, support our wild fisheries. So. Um, yes, we do have concerns and, uh, you know, the monitoring and evaluation component of it is, is sort of how we uh, um, evaluate our actions. Thank you, Alf. Uh, Paul or Darren, you want to add anything? Yeah, I, um, just specifically for our region, you know, we, we have had an increase in fall chinook production at Ringgold, I believe, right, Paul, um, in recent years. We've also um this was the first year we had uh coho returning to Ringgold, where we added um coho to that facility um they were about 250,000 original coho were released from there in 2020 and this like i said was the first year we had um returns where we had a fishery on those fish and, and we are looking at actually adding trout production at our matching factory as well and i'll let paul correct me or fill in any of the blanks <laughs> No, and we're talking about those concerns. We talked about the King of the Reach event. That is, in, that's basically an answer to some of those concerns is getting those wild fish genetics incorporated into our hatchery fish, uh, into our hatchery population. So those fish that, hatchery fish that do spawn out in the wild are similar to our wild fish. And of course, uh, Brian Lyons can tell you, uh, we do our utmost to improve uh, trapping efficiency of our hatcheries. That is, as the hatchery fish come back, they divert off into the hatchery. They're being removed from the wild. And of course, Alf, their science team, we work closely with them, uh, the coder wire tag recovery. So we know uh, how many hatchery fish and which hatchery fish are spawning in the wild and what that balance is. And that gives us the tools we need to be able to manage those populations and make sure, you know, that's not detrimental to our wild populations. All right, thank you. Let's see here. We're gonna, <laughs> we, there's some good questions tonight. And here's a, here's a, here's a good one. Does D, DFW feel there are too many predators in the state? If so, explain why, if not, explain why. If yes, explain future plans to manage the predators. Scott McCorkendale, I might ask you to start with that one. Unless Kelly wants to do this one. <laughs> So I suspect uh, the questioner, when they say predators, they're probably meaning cougars, black bears, wolves, I think, um, maybe coyotes. Um, so all of those animals are native wildlife um, and the agency's mission is to conserve um, all native wildlife for the benefit of the citizens of Washington now and into the future. So um, are there too many predators in the state? Uh, I think the simple answer would be sort of at the state level, certainly, I don't think there's much evidence of that. Um, we do have uh, active management for black bears, active management for mountain lions. Um, we don't manage wolves yet because they're still in a recovery phase. We don't manage, actively manage grizzly bears, even though we have some, uh, again, because they're uh, protected. Uh, coyotes are probably about the most liberal hunting opportunity there is in the state um, for mammals. And all of those animals that we have active management for, there are detailed management um, de plans in the game management plan, which is available online. And so um, in terms of future plans to manage the predators, that's where you're gonna find, uh, at least for cougars and, uh, and black bears, sort of where, what we're doing and intending to do with managing those animals. Um, a lot of times this question comes with a bit of a flavor of uh, concern about impacts to prey populations like deer and elk. Um, in general, 
uh, healthy ungulate populations uh, are pretty robust and sustain natural levels of predation without too much trouble. Um, where things can sometimes get turned around is when something else reduces an ungulate population and creates a scenario where a predator population can have an enhanced effect on a prey population. Maybe the best example is woodland caribou that used to inhabit Northeast Washington and Northern Idaho. Um, those, that population got really small for a bunch of other reasons um, and, and predation eventually became a significant issue there. And certainly what we've got going on in the Blue Mountains, we have a project there to sort of explore um, whether predators or um, predation is a part of that equation. And again, in the game management plan, there's, there's actually a pretty late, clearly laid out uh, approach that the agency takes to assessing whether predators are having any undue effect on a prey population and sort of what the steps would, the agency would take to address that. So um, I hope that helps. Uh, again, it's one of those questions where there's a lot to it. Um, be happy to chat more if somebody would like to follow up with me at the regional office. But I think for this amount of time, I, th I think I'll go with that. Kelly, do you want to add anything to that? Boy, I would have said just what Scott did. Uh, I I think I think he's right. the key is we do have the game management plan that gives us direction on how to manage the predators themselves, and then it does have an opportunity and does lay out a process when when ungulate species are, are struggling, and we determine that it's uh, could be from predators. We we can take management action there, and that's the the evaluation that's going on in the blues right now. All right, thank you. I think we have one last question. This is going to go to. Uh, Captain Weaver, who just came on screen. What are the common infractions that new residents run into and how can they be avoided? Sure, that's a great question. Um, I would start with uh, having the appropriate hunting or fishing license that you're required to have. Uh, if you're a new resident, uh, one thing we do see occasionally is people get confused as far as uh, whether they need a resident license or a non-resident license at the time. So to qualify for a resident license in the state, you have to be a resident uh, here in the state for at least 90 days preceding the purchase of the license. The problem we see sometimes is people coming from another state, depending on what time of year they come, they may actually already have a resident hunting or fishing license in another state. So if that's the case, then you would not be qualified to have a resident license in this state until after that other license you have, a resident license you have uh, has expired. So. That, that's something key to keep in mind. And I'll break this down into hunting versus fishing. Uh, in Washington State, with our fishing regulations that we have, uh, some people coming from other states uh, that may not have the regulations that we have. And what I'm talking about is we have special rules uh, for our fishing uh, on top of our generalized rules. And that's because, you know, depending on which waterway you're fishing, uh, there may be more regulations to protect threatened or endangered species or we may have a, a limit or quota on a given species in a, in a waterway. So when you uh, get your uh, fishing regulation pamphlet, uh, take a look at the waterway to make sure there's not a special rule for the waterway in which you're fishing. And of course, uh, actually you know, take the time to read the regulation pamphlet to see what the general rules are uh, for fishing. And on the hunting side of the house, the one thing that we do see a problem with is uh, having a loaded rifle or shotgun in a motor-driven vehicle. Uh, in Washington, the a loaded rifle or shotgun means having ammunition in the chamber or in the magazine of the firearm. And, and you know, people come from other states may not realize that uh, uh, our regulation is a little bit uh, more stringent as far as what loaded is. The, the other big thing that you want to look at is you, please do take time to read our fishing and hunting regulation pamphlets. If you have a question after you've read them, please reach out to our regional offices. We have some great customer service staff that can ask your questions. And if they can't, uh, they know who to send a question to so that we can get your question answered so you have a fun and enjoyable hunting and fishing experience. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate that. That wraps up the questions. And um, I wanted to just thank everybody for some great, great questions and engagement. Um, if we didn't, uh, if you have more and you want to um, get those answered, several of our folks here have said reach out to them. You can send an email to the director at dfw.wa.gov. Uh, you can also send it to team Yakima at dfw.wa.gov.
wa.gov. And um, I just want to ask Kelly if you got any closing thoughts. Well, just, just to thank everybody for taking time out of your busy schedule and joining us tonight. We really did have some great questions. I uh, hope, hope you got some satisfactory answers. And as Mike said, if you have additional questions, send them in. Thanks for this opportunity. Look forward to coming out and seeing you again on, a, on another round of these open houses. And in the meantime, hope to hope, hope you're out there and getting the great outdoors, enjoying what we have to offer. Thanks, thanks for your time tonight. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good night. <laughs>